Of course, we're here to talk about what I believe to be really a phenomenal book, and I'm not just, uh, just saying that because I was asked to come here and do this interview. It was an extraordinary read for myself as an entrepreneur who, has, uh, who is in a partnership myself, uh, my first author, uh, Tal Ross, and I are now business partners in an online university for relationship skills. And I, I just found myself, as I was reading this book, thinking about so many things that we could be doing differently, so many things that each of you in this room could be doing differently, and we're definitely going to be pulling some of that practical advice out for the end of the interview. But the other thing that was fantastic about this was just the stories, absolutely fantastic stories, as you can imagine, and we're going to hear a few of them uh, probably in the first part of the interview. But probably the most important question today uh, that's on most of your minds is, so are we doing with the Tribune? is the real question. So as many of you have known relative to the news as of late, um, there's been a big question as to one of the new ventures uh, for, for Michael and whether or not he's going to be an investor and perhaps the um, chairman and CEO of the, the Tribune companies. Um, we know you have a love of traditional things. Um, tell us about the future of newspapers a little bit before we start, just to get this out of, out of the way. I actually don't read the Chicago Tribune, I read the LA Times. So. That really responds to that question. Um, it's a, as the Tribune, there's a lot of chatter and misinformation in, in this world, which uh, is part of the news world. Uh, information is up and available everywhere, um, which is an enhancement of the world that I've always been in, which is fiction. So there's a lot of news in this fiction. Uh, You're going to tell us what specifically is fiction? Well, what's not fiction is I, Tornante, a company that I manage a lot of my investments, invested in the debt of Tribune. I thought that was a good investment. Uh, one of the people I chronicle in my book is a, a company called Angelo Gordon. Um, I grew up with John Angelo. My mother grew up with his mother. My grandparents grew up with his grandparents. My children grew up together. My grandchildren are in the same school. So. I, he accepts my phone calls. <laughs> and um, they have bought a lot of debt as, as a company out here called Oatry. And I just thought it was a good investment. And somebody discovered that as public information and drew a lot of wow. dots around it and created a lot of uh, noise. The only thing that is true is I do want it to do well. And if they ask me, do I have any ideas of who could run certain parts of it? I was really given that advice. As far as the industry, it's um, evolving quicker than anybody ever thought. And the next two years, even quicker than anybody imagines. And it's really, the only way I can sum it up is I was driving with my son <clears throat> the other day and I asked him for the time, and I saw he didn't have a watch on. But he gave it to me pretty quickly about eight different devices that are attached somewhere to his body. <laughs> and I realized that that generation does not wear watches. I would feel naked without a watch. I would feel naked without the Los Angeles Times in the morning. But that's not the future. The future is going to be um, brands and the use of brands and the editorial uh, use of uh, material to go into those brands. Unique, one of a kind, movies, books, theater, um, and technology as it relates to basically um, just things that are available there. <coughs> News is now a commodity. Um, stock quotes, whether they're commodities. And you really cannot get a premium pricing on a commodity. When the government licensed three or four television stations in the market, you had an ability for premium pricing. When William Randolph Hearst <coughs> got into a market early that was hard to get into because of the cost, he couldn't have premium pricing. Now, premium pricing is out for commodities. So, it's good news and bad news. The good news is the, the, the consumer has information ubiquitously. The bad news is people like myself who are in this field have to be even more creative as to how they develop to web, deliver commodities to, in, to allow them to premium prices. 
what is your absolute favorite ride at Disney, and what was your favorite Grazer Howard movie? Um, I guess Beautiful Mind would be the, my favorite movie, there's, although they have so many. I really am more attached to Happy Days with Ronnie Howard than I am to any of the others. Um, he and I share a successful history, not really beginning there, but it's really a seminal moment. Uh, my favorite ride, um, driving back into my garage after an extenuating <laughs> tour of the Los Angeles freeway system. <laughs> the garage going up. Um, it's like my children, you really don't want to have a favorite child, although clearly in any single day there may be one. Um, <laughs> they change. Actually, on the, on the favorite child idea, I don't know if you're aware, but the book is phenomenal. Every chapter is a different chronicle of a different uh, magical partnership, as they say in the book. And of course, your relationship with Wells uh, and Barry Diller and others are chronicled in the book. But if you had to pick a favorite child, you can't say John because your relationship with John. What of the partnerships did you most admire after you had a chance to, to interview all ten? Talking to Mary Sue Milliken and Sue Feniger, who are local LA entrepreneurs and three or four restaurants. Um, their history of coming together, how they work together, how they got on the food channel, how they became the hot tamales, uh, cookbooks, how they married the same man, movie guy, you know, it's pretty interesting. Uh, not at the same time. Um, as we know, right? No, they were not married at the same time. One was married to him, decided it wasn't going to work. He was an architect. They separated. Uh, he's, uh, four or five years later, they brought him to design the restaurant. Partner met him. Not a bad guy. Married him, had two children. So they sure man too. Um, so that's really what's interesting, right? Um, but how do you not admire Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger? How do you not admire? Depot. I I thought uh, Valentino and Giancarlo, Giancarlo Giametti, an amazing partnership, an amazing love story over 50 years. Um, of course, uh, I talked about a couple of bridge players. Joe Torre and Don Zimmer in baseball is an unbelievable story about how they both were okay managers, never really succeeded. When they came together, they won four out of five World Series in a row. Um, many of the partnerships, you have the dominant partner, and then you have a partner that enjoys being more in the shadows. But it's, but it's extremely important. Warren Buffett was my agent in this book. I mean, not liberally. He so much wanted Charlie Munger to get the credit that he deserved. And uh, encouraged me to write the book. And I actually was <coughs> doing a lot of other things in each one of these interviews, each one of these chapters, took a lot of research. And then I had to learn about Bill Gates's other partnerships before I really understood his partnership with his wife. And just so you know, almost every chapter goes back and there's a lot of um, background information, almost to the extent, how did this individual get ready to have that ultimate partnership? So obviously with the Bill and Melinda Gates chapter, there's so much about the early relationship between Paul Allen, so much about that emanating relationship with uh, Steve Ballmer and how important that was with you, a lot of conversation about Barry Diller before the Frank Wells. And even in like the Bill Gates chapter, we all know everything we know about Bill Gates. No, uh, we don't. And I discovered that it, it wasn't just Paul Allen, it was two other guys. Right. One of whom was tragically, was his closest teenage friend in his computer world, who died tragic uh, biker hiking accident. And that changed Bill in a certain way. And then his other partner was one of the first employees of Microsoft and had been a partner for TKG. Well, well let's, talk, let's, as well. let's talk about what makes these folks ready for such a partnership. Um, you had your mother and father very early on who had such a deep partnership to the point where they were absolutely inseparable. It was that wonderful quote in the book about uh, Anytime you try to play one off of the other, your father would always remind you where your place was. Um, and then you, got, then, then you derived to Barry Diller, and you had 
Bill Gates, who had his early, very, and he never did anything, as he said, without partnerships. For this audience, I guess the question is, are there some people here who are just naturally good at partnerships and will emanate, you know, and sort of come to them? Or is it, it can't be a learned skill? I happen to have a point of view on that, but I'm curious your point. Well, I think it can be a learned skill. And um, first of all, I did a lot of studying in some, a lot of media on longitudinal studies. One at Harvard for 70 years. Um, of what created a better life, what created happiness. And uh, it started in 39, and included the class of 40, 39, 40, 41, including Jack Kennedy's class, by the way. Every five years they did uh, physicals, psychological testing, and you'd be surprised to learn that it, it wasn't wealth, it wasn't exercise, it, it, it was the conclusion of the happiest people people had a single, sustained relationship over a long period of time, ups and downs. Often that was a spouse, but equally often it was a, um, a business partner. And the fact of the matter is when you're in the foxhole together, and it goes bad, and you have dark humor about it, and you're against the world, or when it's great, and you're high-fiving each other, those people, and all the people I caught in the book, myself included, I think are happier for having found somebody to share the misery and the happiness of a relationship. And all these new companies, young companies, people starting restaurants, tailor shops, you know, uh, uh, technology companies, generally they start with partnerships. And it, as you get older, you start to learn the more important thing about partnerships and the thing that was key to all of these partnerships is a lack of envy and jealousy as to your partner. Well, you, you even pointed out Gates later in life was more capable of stepping back and letting Steve take the role. He might not have been able to do that earlier. And he pointed, and Gates pointed out, it really was an issue of maturity that gave him that capacity to, to step back. But even young people can have it. And they can have the, they can recognize that one plus one can equal three, that you don't have to be jealous of your partner, you obviously have complementary skills. I mean, Warren says, much better than, than I'm saying it now, is, you know, let's talk about the seven deadly sins. He says, you know, uh, you know, gluttony, he said, I like to eat, later I feel a little guilty, but it feels pretty good to have a big meal. He said, we all know lust is kind of fun. Uh, you can feel badly about it later, you're in trouble, all that. He says, envy, it makes you sick from the moment you have it to the middle of the operation to the end. Envy is horrible. And if you can withdraw envy or jealousy against your partner, you can succeed. And if you can't, you fail. And bad people, however you define them, really don't make partners. Because eventually they turn at each other. So I kept looking for bad partnerships. There must be Hitler and Schmittler or somebody, you know. And at the end of the day, there isn't because they generally do each other in. One of the things that struck me in your book was a wonderful quote that you said that um, you fundamentally feel that the entertainment industry is the most ethical, one of the most ethical industries. In the, come on, you all can laugh. <laughs> um, but actually, I thought your logic was, was, was not just uh, interesting, but really sound. Can you speak a little bit about the transactional nature of some relationships, the, the re uh, of some businesses versus the relationship nature and what that yields relative to ethics? There's no question, and I've been in a lot of businesses, the entertainment industry, aside from, you know, uh, pundits who enjoy writing about Lindsay Lohan, the, um, is extremely ethical, and for the following reasons. You start with television. Television historically has been um, licensed by the government, so there's a lot of oversight. Secondly, the transactions are so often, and they always receive the contract, because there's so many, there's 60 or 70 deals for every television show or movie and so forth. So between those two things, you have to be, and the third thing is you're always dealing with the same people, same agents, same managers, same lawyers. So if you're not of your word, you're out. Now when you go to the movie business, doesn't quite have the government oversight, 
not quite as easy to be of your word. You get to, I mean, not able to accept every bit of the word. You then get to the music industry, a lot of young people, inexperienced, um, from all sorts of walks of life. But then you had real estate, where your only transaction per that person buy or sell once, forget it. You can say, you know, we had lunch last week and you agreed that it was going to cost $100. And you look at me right in the eyes and you say, I was in Calcutta. We didn't have lunch with By the way, this is a wonderful story in the book. I was howling, laughing. But it's true. The, the, guy, the guy said to him, literally, uh, no, I'm sorry, I was in London at that point in time. And he had had lunch with him at the Four Seasons in New York. And he just looked at him in the eye and said, no, no, I, I was in London at the time. So the fact of the matter is, industries where you're dealing with the same people all the time, the transactions are so multiple, and the, the actual work is finished before you ever get to the contract, have to be of your word. I thought that was interesting. While we're talking about different industries, um, let me go to the financial services and the recent, maybe not so recent, but certainly memorable uh, crisis that we had. And you made the observation that um, that had the basis of relationships been stronger, had there been more of the of the of the lessons that you teach in this book relative to partnerships, had more of that happened, perhaps we wouldn't have had the the financial crisis in the way that we did. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? I, I found I absolutely agree with you. I feel that the the, the values that you talk about here were part of the, the reason that that degraded. Well, I'm, I'm not sure you would have avoided all of it, but American business is honest, and by and large, people do the right thing. But there's always those that don't to create the problem. In a partnership, you have the checks and balances. Ethics is reminded to you. Moral compass is straightened, often by your partner. And many single proprietors have trouble walking past the mirror. They really, wow. I was pretty good there. Uh, they get very arrogant in their success. They believe the lawyer when the lawyer says you can do it instead of the smell test. Of, really? I can murder somebody? Well, yeah, and that state is allowed. Oh, okay. You know, so many times you're given information that just is not correct. And when you have a partner kind of look at each other and say, is that really right? Is that counting thing? Did that feel wrong? So partnerships tend to um, alleviate that knee-jerk reaction of, I can do anything. Secondly, in the book I study, Angela Gordon, and I look at a lot of people's past, and this is a company that survived the meltdown without a flaw. They've grown their company unbelievable from zero. They're extremely well-respected. And what did they do? They didn't. They believed that they would never do anything with a customer that they wouldn't do themselves. And they never believed in leverage. And the reason they didn't believe in leverage is one of the partners was an L.F. Lodgechild, working his ass off as just a guy. He got stock options. The stock went way up. It's like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Of, of, maybe it turned out to be about six or seven hundred thousand dollars. He exercised his options. But the firm had a policy that you, had it. you couldn't sell it, your stock. So instead of selling the stock, he borrowed the money to pay for the options. So now he borrowed and borrowed $500,000. But it was worth a million dollars, so it was great. And then there was a recession, and the stock went down to be worth $50. He owed $500,000. He was broke. He had a family, he had two kids, they were living in New Jersey. And when he went to business with John Angelo and borrowed the money to pay off his debt, he decided that their firm was never going to be put in the same position that he was in. So when all this craziness was going on, and Wall Street was saying, oh, borrow more money, borrow more money, put on debt, do anything, it's great. He didn't. And his history and his partnership with John kept them going in an area that they never got in trouble. You also have greatest quick little tips dealing with ethics. The day, or maybe it was the week, of his, uh, his first uh, having come on board as CEO, um, Frank asked you to write a $15,000 check for expenses just in case 
there are any clerical errors on their expenses in the future, it would already be paid for. <laughs> Which I just think, you know, again, we talked about the issue of, of an individual and two partners keeping each other in check. And by the way, and, no good deed goes unpunished. We wrote every year a ten dollars or $15,000 check for a decade okay. uh, to make sure that if, if we didn't have the right to see, if somebody put in something wrong, that we, that we covered it. And about three years after that, Mark Hurd might have taken that advice along the way. But three years after that, the IRS came to me and said, we want to check what is going on that you're paying <laughs> extra money to the company. Something must be off here. I said, no, I told the story. It took about four weeks for them to finally come back to me and say, you know what, now we believe it. So, so, so let's talk about Frank Wells. There's lots of great stories about Frank. In, in Los Angeles, in the, um, you know, in the ether, there's also a lot of fantastic stories in here, including the first one, which I, didn't, I wasn't aware of, which is in your negotiations, um, it was originally proposed that you were going to be co-CEOs, and he, right at the final step, just stepped aside and allowed you to be the sole CEO of the business, um, even though he had you know, the, the relationship with the family, etc., and some, some right to that. Um, but for the sake, just before we got to dive into the details of the partnership question, are there any great Frank Wells stories that perhaps didn't make it to the book because they weren't fit for print or, or whatever? <laughs> but, you know, just tell us a fantastic uh, story in honor of your of your friend. Every day was a fantastic story. I mean, every day was not just a Frank, but everybody else. When you're running fast and you're running a company that's involved with movies and television, and theme parks, real estate. Every day there's something, and Frank was unique, and everybody thought that I was the crazy one. I had hair way up. <laughs> I still don't wear clothes like Frank did. He was I'm like, a, like a New Yorker. He is like this Adonis Clint Eastwood, you know, son of a Navy admiral kind of guy. Stanford lawyer, Rhodes Scholar. How did he be a Rhodes Scholar? Was interesting. He had to be an athlete. He was a terrible athlete. So he played water polo for six weeks to be able to qualify. For <laughs> but anyway, he was a, he was an athlete. He was an athlete student, and everybody expected that Frank was stable and I was whatever. <laughs> Sid Bass was asked this question recently. It was the principal for 20 percent shareholder at Disney, is it true that Michael is crazy and Frank is stable and straight and all that? And Sid said, no, no, they're both crazy. <laughs> so Frank, I was, if you can believe this, the stability, I was the one that held him down. If I said to Frank, let's go to Afghanistan and put a theme park He'd say he was too. such a supporter of mine, he'd say, he'd be on the plane. <laughs> I was about to do a, a former associate of his at Warner Brothers after six weeks working with him, and I said, let's discuss Frank Wells for a second. And at a function, black night function, I was one by a table. He fell down left. He said, you've discovered it. He said, discovered what? He said, well, if I would say to Frank, why don't we put Robert Redford in the Bad News Bears. Frank would be driving over the hill to meet Robert Redford before somebody said, wait, 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 there is no role for Robert Redford in the Bad News Bears. He was such an enthusiast and so smart. So one of the things that a lot of people would think is that great partnerships are perfectly complementary, meaning you're, you're absolutely the opposite of track. And in actuality, in many of these, um, Warren Buffett once said, I don't think it was in, in your book that I read this, but Warren Buffett once said that he and his relationship with Charlie, they were Siamese twins. You and Frank, you, you dispelled the rumor that you were different. In fact, you were more similar than not. Um, can think. you speak a little bit to that, that yin and yang versus actually similarities of track? What are you really looking for? Well, if you look at Brian Grayson and Ronnie Howard, one has spiked hair, like that basketball player for the Nuggets, whatever the guy's name is. It. <laughs> and one looks like Richie Cunningham, right? <laughs> But deep down, they have the same values. Um, oh my God, I, my, my strongest relationship is a 43-year marriage. 
in a billion years, nobody would think it would have lasted a week. Uh, my wife is from the Midwest. She comes, mother was born in Sweden. I'm from uh, Manhattan, Jewish. Um, we think basically on all important points, except what to watch on television. The same, <laughs> we do. I mean, Jewish and Unitarian, same thing. Well, so let's, let's go to the back. <laughs> <laughs> they, sort of, they sort of opposite the shoes they meet they, around together. I think it's Jesus Christ. They're very much the same. <laughs> um, let, let's, when, when we think, when we pick apart the concept of relationships, we break it down into three different areas. There are mindsets, the ways you think about relationships, um, then there's process, the way you manage relationships, and then there are skills. Let's stay on the mindsets for a second, because I think that's the core issue. The belief system and the values have to be similar. And it was, um, it, 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 one of the things I'd like to hope to do today is that some people walk away from here saying, I've got to get this book because as a business person or as a careerist, um, I'm missing the opportunity because I'm not in that kind of a partnership or have even begun to navigate in that direction, which I think is what you're ushering. One of the reasons for that is we're taught when we're in kindergarten to like share, right? Don't throw up on your sister, don't hit her in the face, <laughs> give her your toys, all that stuff. By the time you get to fifth grade, kill it. You know, win the soccer game, you know, get the best SAT score, win the, throw the winning touchdown. We turn from a society of sharing to a society of individual accomplishment. And you believe that that happens in the education system? I think it happens in society because we love heroes. And that's fine, because most heroes behind them is somebody that's got some pillow talk or they succeed for more than a week. If we continue to impress our kids to share, even though it's very hard to do, throughout school, through business school, talk about partnerships, I think you have a better shot of having a more fulfilling life. Look, you're speaking to the core passion and mission that uh, my entire organization and life has had. So the question is, let's help this audience think about how. Just, just to add a punctuating remark, I know that uh, um, Mehmet Oz, Dr. Oz on television, went back when he was just a cardiac surgeon, used to say that the one thing he would note is that the uh, acceleration of healing for heart surgery was directly correlated to the strength of a marriage. When a husband and a wife were there together at the bedside, the quickness with which somebody healed. The Gallup organization has now proven that the number one predictor of productivity in the workplace is whether you have a friend at work. Question number 10 on their engagement survey. So if, if the data and the statistics are all correlated to your message. I should have interviewed you. <laughs> <laughs> I have no statistics. <laughs> That's okay. The stories make up for them. Um, but if the data and the statistics are there, then we've got to ask the question, why? Why is it that we're losing this? And why is it it isn't being taught? And then I guess the next question is, are you going to join me on the stump speeches to make sure that it is? But let's start with, why do you think it's not? I understand that was an interesting point around the hero. But um, this is, it, it's so clear, and yet there's not enough books like this that have been written on the subject. I think it's very prevalent. I think there, every organization has a lot of partnerships. Uh, most companies start with partnerships. Um, so I think it is there. I just don't think people feel as good about it as they should or are aware of it as much as they should and realize that some of their biggest heroes, right. you know, a Valentino wouldn't exist without John Carlo Giamatti. If you haven't seen The Last Emperor, the movie about that relationship, it's fantastic. And it's, you know, life is about love, and work, you know, it is. And work and partnerships can tie all that together. So I, I think, I think people recognize it. They also sometimes, just like in a marriage, you get a bad partner, and 50% of marriages supposedly don't work. If you have a bad partner, I would suggest move on and find them, and, and, and don't drive yourself crazy. Some people are incapable of being partners. They just are. 
let's, let's talk a little bit about that concept of love and intimacy. Whether or not Bill and Melinda, um, the Valentino love affair, those were real love relationships that were also business partnerships and are also uh, purposeful partnerships. Um, but then you have um, yourself and Frank, you have uh, Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager, and, and I think it was um, Schrager that even talked about his love affair with Steve, non-sexual love affair, where the two of them saw each other literally every day, you know, for, for 20 years. Um, you know, words like intimacy and love aren't often bantered about in the workplace. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that and the criticality of that depth of intimacy to achieve the, the success of the relationship you're talking about, the business relationship? Most of the people I study have that deep respect for each other. At the same time, most of them feel there has to be separation. Bernie Marcus and Arthur Bryant Blank did not socialize together. Uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger lived 2,000 miles apart. Um, everyone, is, everyone is different, but everyone has a love of each other. Lonnie Howard and Brian Glazer actually expressed it to me in Ryan's book. It is a love that really centers around respect, gratitude, appreciation, honor, those kinds of things. And if you don't have it, eventually it starts to fall apart. Most people, would frankly me, I know for sure, I always knew he was smarter than I was. And he thought he, I was smarter than he was. So we both kind of respected each other, and we both were smart in completely different ways. Um, but it, there was, there is a distinction between deep respect and 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 deep intimacy and care. And it seemed like so many of these relationships spilled over from deep respect to a real personal relationship. And yet, in the business world, it's not you know it's, it's not person it's not business it's not personal it's 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 business. These things that were taught again are antithetical to the themes that I saw in your book. I don't think there's an absolute rule for every partner. But generally, um, when you talk to somebody every day, uh, often more often than your spouse, that they're, you're in each other's offices, that you're, you're, you're in trouble together, the financing is going bad, the movie didn't open, nobody came to your restaurant, all those things, and you recover from that, because failure is also a very important part of solidifying um, partnerships. But in Bill Gates's, since he had a partnership with his father, he had a partnership with his high school friends, he had a partnership with uh, Steve Ballmer, Palmer, and now he has a partnership with his wife in philanthropy, because they're both gifted. When, when Warren Buffett teaches, and he teaches five times a year in Omaha, he brings these gifted uh, students, and he has asked them, who would you want 10% of in this class for the rest of your life, the rest of their life, and why? And they go through this, and then who would you sell 10% short? Who would you want to like, get rid of and make a problem? And it always comes down to, if you have intelligence, it's very important. If you have uh, energy, it's very important. If you have all these things are very, very important. If you don't have integrity, it will never work. And then he makes the point that integrity can be learned. It is an acquired taste. You can learn that it's better to do it in a trustworthy way. I want to ignite the desire to sell more books at the end here with, with the following question. Why do these folks need to consider partnerships um, as opposed to maybe the path that they are on today? You mentioned in the book a couple of things. Gates talks about Probably the simplest way to talk about this book is being in a great partnership, you are smarter, faster. In other words, two heads are better than one, you know, diversity of inputs, you accelerate the, uh, the right answer quick. Um, our research has shown that you end up taking more risks because you actually feel safer to be able to innovate more with another individual as opposed to questioning and doubting yourself, etc. So I think Frank probably gave you a lot of that underlying support. What are some of the real reasons to go get into and stretch yourself a little bit into a partnership. If you look at the just the Joe Torre Don Zimmer analysis of baseball, 
neither of which had won apart, but together, Joe Torrey felt that he wasn't good enough and he was very conservative. And Don Zimmer was, you know, a shoot from the hips kind of guy. And when they came together, Don Zimmer said to Joe Torrey, I don't want your job. I've been a manager for 20 years. I'm 80, he's now 80, he's probably 70 something. And I'm just giving you advice. And I'm going to give you advice that is off the wall. And if you don't take it, it's fine. But you're going to hear what I think you should do. And all of a sudden, Joe Torrey became a better manager. And they took risks, but risks in a confined environment. I have a speech a lot about uh, the, the financial bots. Now, what you do is, and I, I went Disney my, and Paramount exactly this way. I would create a financial box around the product, a movie, a television show, a book, or whatever it is. I would do it. I would say to people, do it to me. Tell me how much I can spend. And the day I bounce up against that box, I want a red flag and want, I want you to come to my house and throw me against the wall, et cetera, et cetera, for the whole organization. So we created a conservative approach to massive risk making. We knew we would take a risk up to a point, but we would never bet the store on any individual product. So many people, without partners, without the consummate person saying, are you insane? Their risk goes over the line. So risk is important, but so is, hey, Watch out. One of the things that I see in many organizations that I think tanks them is conflict avoidance, inability to tell the truth. Um, the emperor has no clothes, or in your case, the, the prince. Um, so the, the question would be, uh, do you see in these kind of partnerships the pathway, perhaps, for more business to have more truth telling, more courage? Well, you bring up a good point. I can remember what a very close friend of mine was a producer who came to my office and I had a suit jacket on and didn't match the pants and I had socks that didn't match. And he said, you're, you're over. I said, what do you mean I'm over? He said, look at you. I said, oh yeah. He said, no, it's not that you're wearing that. So you spent the entire day at Paramount and nobody told you. <laughs> nobody told you how stupid you were. <laughs> and the Barry Diller, who was out of town that day, he would have told me immediately, so yes, everybody's afraid of insulting the boss. And everybody wants to please the boss. And having, I didn't write this in the book, so don't buy it if you're looking for that, but it's true. That's a, that's a good enough reason to have a partner. That at least he'll tell you that you're full crap. <laughs> and by the way, I got that out of the book, so if you read between the lines, <laughs> it's, uh, it's I in there. I believe it. Me, you. You know, you, you, you tell your partner, and I, I do this with my wife all the time, I say, tell me what you think. And then she does, and I say, I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> so you really want to be open to the information. And I go to a movie theater, which is die. She'd say, how did you make that movie? How did you make that terrible movie? And I've been married for a few years, and I've said this 27 times. Jane? I look for the worst script I could find. <laughs> I look for the worst director and the worst actors. And look how well I did. <laughs> so it's actually, let's, let's stay on, on Jane for a second. Um, can, can you tell me a little bit, I imagine, and maybe you've not thought about this, but I imagine the depth of the partnership that you had with Frank taught you a lot as a business person. And certainly I know from uh, your admiration for your wife Jane that she has taught you a lot, uh, that you've imported. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, what have you learned from Jane that you brought into your partnerships at Disney? And what have you learned from Frank that you brought home? Well, every partnership I've had, including Barry Diller before that and others, some people think and really are geniuses. And the rest of us don't understand how we ever got our shoes tied. So you really, if you're smart, you want to hear what other people think. And more and more, the more successful you get, the more they won't tell you. So you always know when you come home at night, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear about the kid, the guy at school, 
you know, all of a sudden the big world that you live in comes right down to, you know, the kid threw up your shoe. You know, so, so you have a relationship with your spouse that gets to the very nature of existence. And she is not going to, unless you're a real tyrant, let you get away with much. And that is true of the partner. They, you learn from the fact that they'll be honest with you. Now, I do say to people that I work with, it would be nice if you're honest with me in private. <laughs> I just assume you're not telling me I'm the biggest fool in the world in front of the entire company. So, I mean, there's a way to do it. There are tactful ways to do it. By the way, there's some really beautiful, sort of lovely, touching stories in the book. Uh, one particular that was actually helpful to me as I was reading it. Um, where you would come home and your instant reaction, and Jane being as wonderful as she is, she says, well, tell me what's going on at work, what deals are you doing? And, the la and you're just sitting there overwhelmed saying, you're just paused and you're saying, the last thing I want to talk about is all the garbage I left at Disney today. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, which probably makes her feel a little shut out, etc. And then all of a sudden you start talking about the kids and then you work your way back around to being soft enough to say, well, and by the way, here's what happened at work. And start that coaching. And, I have um, a lot of discussion on that subject with Bill and Melinda Gates. How did they separate? And, well, they, they're interesting because he is the number one iconic figure in America, and she is the wife. So they go into a meeting with you know, a minister or secretary of state, and she's ignored. And then three minutes into it, they realize she's a force of her own, and now they're a team. And then I said to her, can't talk about philanthropy and Microsoft. How boring. That's what you do all day long, you talk about that. She said, no. We talk about this kid's grades and the window they broke and the house was not clean. And the, well, whatever we all talk about. It's a big house to keep clean. And <laughs> <laughs> I think when they take the long walks, little rituals. So they start sure. to concentrate on, on what are they going to do about it. I, I want to go to the audience. One quick question before we, so certainly you were about to transition for you all to ask some questions. But, um, so, look, I mean, you had this wonderful experience with Diller. Uh, you had this uh, rich experience with Wells. How'd you get it so wrong with Ovitz? <laughs> well, that's not unique. I've got it wrong with a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> what did you learn? Maybe what did you learn? I find, out, you learn I find out good practice there. Um, look, how many people have said to you, which you never believe, after they get divorced, you know, when he was walking down the aisle, or when she was walking down the aisle, I thought to myself, what am I doing? <laughs> and you say, and when you hear the story, you say, oh yeah, 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 just make it serious. But no, there are certain things that are not meant to be. And I made a mistake. And I had just had a heart operation. We had just bought Cattle City's ABC. We almost had 100,000 employees. Um, <coughs> I knew him forever. I never bought anything from him. I knew him forever. My wife really wanted me to have help. And I did it. And the thing that, that Warren Buffett said to me, now he tells me, he told me in advance, I'm convinced he told me after the fact. <laughs> either, either way, it was right. He said, look at me in the I'm a ham. I love to be on the stage. I love to play the guitar. I love to be on the cover of Fortune. You know, I'm a big old fool. He said, Charlie doesn't want to see his name read in the paper. So we're perfect. He said, you and Frank are perfect. And, you know, uh, you know uh, Don Zimmer and Joe are perfect. And Gio, uh, Giametti and Valentino are perfect. And that, and that kind of sets. Um, he said, I could have told you. Willingness to play their clear roles. Or just their general personality, their, their DNA. You know, I'm, I basically prefer to be a stand-up comic when I do it. Michael would have tried to push me off the stage to do it as well. I mean, we just were two type A's, and so it just wasn't, it just didn't work. And I knew it quickly, and we resolved it quickly, and I, I'm not saying it was his fault or my fault. You know, some people, just aren't meant to be partners, and you move on to somebody else. Speak, speaking of being a ham, I was watching YouTube clips last night of you with the Muppets uh, doing Wonderful World of Disney. Are you glad you did all of that? Did you put yourself out with that persona? I know Barry Diller, I think it was Barry Diller that was suggesting you shouldn't have done it at the time. Was that, was that something you enjoyed doing? 
Well, those are two separate subjects. Uh, <laughs> three separate subjects. The first subject was. Careful the frog is the first one. The first subject is should I post at all? And Frank Wells, this is typical Frank Wells, is my life story. You got it. You got it. Because he knew you wanted to, or because he thought you'd be great at it? Two things. He felt the company, which had been rudderless for two decades, two decades, needed some the, the public, the Wall Street, to know there was somebody in charge. Two, he sensed they wanted to try it. And that was his loyalty. Everybody else was against it. And particularly people in the company who had the jealousy and the fact of who is this bozo who's coming in to try to act like Walt and all that stuff. Barry's point of view was, do it, but your life will forever be changed because you will no longer be a private person. Most CEOs are private people. And he was 100% right for the good and the bad, and frankly, 100% right for the good and the bad. I've got, I'm going to hold a couple of wrap-up questions. Uh, let's go to the audience. And then the lady in the back, way up there, shout it out. Or we can. Uh, actually, I'm a That's pretty good. <laughs> so now that you are in a position where you can partner with anyone in your life to do anything at all, um, what is it that you? What is your ideal project, regardless of money, regardless of age, regardless of anything else? What would you do now with all your hindsight experience? Well, first of all, it's actually the reverse. When, when you have unlimited capital at Disney, you can do almost anything you want. And I, I want to say I loved it, but I love the ability to say, oh, let's make this into a movie. It was called Splash. It was called Splash. Very good. I love the creative freedom that success gives you and capital. Uh, it's not that I don't have some capital and don't have access to capital, but it's different. Um, my wife would say, or would hope I would say, is being a grandparent and seeing my grandchildren grow up. But until they're talking, <laughs> I'm not as interested in the shields. <laughs> but then they start, I don't get it. They, they see the little baby up lying there and they can stay there all day. <laughs> What's, where's the next act? <laughs> um, next act's a little messier. Right. And, uh, so I still like the area of uh, anything that's creative, uh, theater, movies, art, technology that enhances theater, movies, art. I don't really like technology for the sake of technology. I like it for what it can do in kind of exciting new things. I have too many ideas with not enough people telling me they're stupid. Because uh, I'm so used to my wife saying they're stupid that I ignore it. So I, I got to control myself as to not do too many things. But I, I just had a good time. All I right. enjoyed writing a book because I enjoy it. I did it with a partner, by the way, Aaron Cohen, who worked with me. He worked with me in a book I wrote at camp. And I enjoyed that partnership. And I really enjoyed the interview. Right? It's it's really well written. I'm assuming Aaron played a great role in helping you tell me those stories. <laughs> well, two things he did. He did a lot of research. He was really fun to talk to, and he, he's also won several Emmys now in sports. So he was very helpful in the Joe Torrey thing. But the fun part about it was Microsoft Word. I love the title. It was Microsoft Word. I write a chapter, and he'd take it and cross everything out, <laughs> and I get it back, and I rewrite the whole thing. And that process was more fun than just sitting there and doing it yourself, because it was a constant, lesser versions of Melville to Hawthorne and back. Melville to Hawthorne. If a book from you comes out and it isn't a great story, we'd have a problem, and it is. It's a great story. Gentlemen. Jeff. 
Hi, yeah, I'm a commercial real estate broker, so I guess I'm at the uh, bottom of the ethical ladder you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, it goes way down. <laughs> That's as far as, I, it's as far as I've got. Okay. Believe me, it goes way down. Manager of the training group. My question is actually pretty simple, and um, it's this. Um, the partner, the person that you go to, uh, the partner that helps navigate your questions, your, your life, can that at least impart your relationship with God or a higher power for your answers? Um, for many people, I think they probably answer, for many people, the answer is probably yes. For me, it probably is no. Only because my father was an atheist. So I grew up in a non-religious home. His mother died when he was 10. He had a terrible experience with religion. They sent him off to wherever. So he always had an attitude, which of course he bestowed upon his children. I don't have that attitude. I don't present any of it. I just haven't gotten there in that area. So when I see people relying on that, I just can't, I don't get there. I would rather rely on somebody saying, somebody that I can actually hear in the room. Now some people hear it spiritually. I gotta hear, I gotta hear it right there. And unfortunately, the record shows that a lot of the people who profess great spirituality and religion are often very hypocritical. So I'm, I become cynical. So in this interview, we've gone from um, gay partnerships to religion. Let's talk about, about politics. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all there. <laughs> Let the, the um, the state of the world today, I mean, you, you're clearly writing this for the individual, be a better careerist, be a better business person, and at the end, it's a wonderful chapter, be happier through your relationships. Um, but if you look at the state of the world today, and the education reform, um, all the things that have to happen in society, are we gonna get there without these skills? Are we gonna get there without greater collaboration, without greater partnerships across government, business, uh, NGOs, etc., and uh, and and if and if you believe that that's important, uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Well, I definitely think we're going to get there. I'm, a, you know, the opposite to, to your questions. I'm a complete optimist. I'm totally Panglossian. I think this is the best of all possible worlds. I don't think by nature uh, people are by just. I don't think they're born spiteful. I think they can become spiteful. Uh, I think the, the strength of us lies in the political establishment. I think we all take for granted our constitution, free speech, all the things that were given. Uh, I never made a movie or a television show that any governmental body ever questioned or even thought about it. It's just makes the world that exists. You make a film almost anywhere else, oh my God. <coughs> What is the president administration going to think? You may, you just, it doesn't even occur to you. The freedom that we have to express ourselves is such a monumental positive that I believe we will survive the present economic downturn. Do I, do I have an overwhelming opinion about taxes? No. Do I think I'll live through whatever comes up at whichever Tea Party or Coca-Cola Party or whatever party comes out of the next three years. <laughs> yes, I, I'm just so optimistic. Do I have I have a foundation that's fairly large and that only concentrates in Southern California? I see all the problems in the schools, uh, in the in, in youth. I, I, I see movies and I make movies about it. We have a lot of horrible problems. They're not as horrible as elsewhere in the world. So I'm optimistic. Uh, yes, I have my points of view. I don't want to vote for it or I wouldn't vote for it. But usually that's based on the person themselves. I don't like the hypocrisy of 
people saying things because they think the pub that will that'll go well with the public. Well, I know in fact that, especially the ones I know, don't believe it. Gentlemen, right down the middle. History will be written somewhat on the which is not the time of the year. You didn't know the first, it's also the first. Every night, too much to look at that stock market, wondering how we're doing. 1.8 billion to 80 billion. Uh, you know, not a bad set of shareholder value. But. I never looked. People would tell me. I did. I, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say never. Mm -hmm. But I. But if your concentration is only on that, you're going to make a lot of short-term mistakes. By the way, Wall Street gives you exactly wrong information at the wrong time. Right now, during the during the, the 2007, what was Wall Street saying to American corporations and applying for spend, borrow, build, look how it's going, isn't it great? And what are they saying now? Hoard your money, don't spend, it's too dangerous. So what we're hearing from Wall Street, in my opinion, is the opposite of what you should be doing. So I don't look. I listen, but I don't, you know, if, 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 you, know you don't want your stock and you have a company called Tops. You certainly don't want to get to a point when you're in, in, in uh, need of additional capital because you're going to break bank covenants. And all of a sudden you're going to be, the banker's going to be like in uh, Mary Poppins before they become great people. It's going to be knocking at the door. Um, you don't want that. But an obsession with your stock price is, um, and running your company only for your stock price, I think is a mistake. Quick question over here. We have a last question from the audience, and then we'll do a couple summary comments. Good morning. My name is Ryan. I'm in movie distribution. Congratulations on where you've gotten. You, you're a new company that invests in other companies. I think you bought a company called Team Baby or invested in a company called Team Baby. My question is why and what do you look for in other companies and partnerships? Um, I don't know. I read an article in the LA Times about this guy in Houston who was making videos for little kids. I had been involved with Baby Einstein. Seemed like a great idea. Flew down to Houston made a deal, started the company. Probably should have done a little more research. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I did that. Uh, an associate that works with me in, in my office read an article about Tops. They were having a lot of dissident shareholder trouble. I thought to myself, boy, Tops, that's like Disney. There's a brand that you say the word, kind of feel your, your, your skin move because you had that. Thought you had a Mickey Mantle 52, <laughs> you didn't really have it, and your mother threw out your box of cards, and you're still angry about that. <laughs> There's something in the culture about Tops, and we went and met with them. I don't have a, I, I don't have a good system. I, 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 I couldn't write a book about how to invest. But he can write a book about marketing. <laughs> <laughs> stayed up last night and I read it. Again, um, truly for the second time, not just because it was in preparation. I had somebody else get all these questions together. I didn't have to do it. I did it because I wanted to. And I did it because I wanted to because I think in today's society, more than ever, we've got to recognize that the old Tayloristic um, industrial society where you're in a box and you have your role and your responsibility, you don't have to go outside of that. It's dead. Wherever any of you in this room want to go, you can't get there alone. And you've got to get better at this. You've got to get better at this. And where better to learn than from the icons who you might have even uh, be surprised uh, didn't also get there alone. And some of the basic recognized skills of, of real relationships, not transactional relationships, of, of knock down, drag out candor in your life that all you need more truth tell. That, um, the sense that even Bill Gates said, sometimes you just need to be weak and somebody to be afraid with uh, inside, of your, inside of your camp. Um, this book teaches you that. And I, and I can't tell you how excited I am that somebody of your eminence and your success in business is 
not only having come to that conclusion for yourself and made you a success, but bringing it to, uh, to everyone else. And I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.